Hey everybody, today we're going to start looking at Avid MIDI Composer. Avid MIDI Composer is a video editing system. It is specifically a non-linear video editing system, which means you edit on a computer, which sounds kind of normal and natural, but there was a time. Avid is an extremely popular video editing system. It is maybe the most popular video editing system in the country, if not the world. It's used in feature films and in television shows and in major broadcast news networks. It's been around for a really long time. It may be one of the first video editing systems out there. My experience was I was editing back in the 90s and I was editing on tape. So I was editing in a linear environment, which means I was copying from one VTR to another VTR and making a linear sequence of footage. But there was this talk about computer-based video editing where you would digitize footage and then bring it in and work in a computer system. This idea of non-linear, an NLE video editing system. And Avid was the proverbial big kid in the block. Everyone was talking about Avid and how Avid was going to be the future of video editing. And so I took an Avid course. I went to New York City and took an Avid 101 course. It was a three-day course. I walked out of there thinking, I know everything about video editing, which I obviously didn't. I'm still learning things about Avid I didn't know. But Avid was really popular, it was really big, and so it was there. And then around the same time, there was some other software out there. There was a software called MIDI 100. And if you read magazines or Video Maker magazine, you'd read about this idea that MIDI 100 was going to be the next big software that was going to replace Avid and put Avid out of business. Well, years went on, MIDI 100 no longer exists, and Avid is still there. And then maybe a few years after that, there was a system called Division? which was going to be another replacement to Avid. You know, throw away your Avid. You won't use it anymore. Division is going to be the new system for computer-based video editing. It's going to revolutionize the industry. Division doesn't exist anymore. These companies are not there. And in the late 90s, there was Final Cut Pro. And you've heard of Final Cut Pro. Final Cut Pro was, was a big deal. It was a more affordable Avid. And it was basically worked similar to an Avid. It had some features that Avid didn't have. And it was going to be a really big deal. And people really liked it. And they liked the way it worked. And... Final Cut Pro is going to be this big, huge software. And I, I honestly believed it because, you know, people like Walter Murch were editing on an Avid system or editing on a Final Cut Pro system. And people like the Coen brothers had moved over to Final Cut Pro and they were working in the industry on major films doing Final Cut Pro. And I thought, I don't know, Final Cut Pro was becoming really popular and people really liked it. And, you know, people weren't talking about Avid as much anymore. And I thought maybe, maybe Final Cut Pro is going to be the software that put Avid out of business. Well, years have gone on, and Avid is still here. It is still, as far as I know, leading the industry. There's a lot of networks, a lot of filmmakers, a lot of TV shows, a lot of documentaries that are still using Avid. Uh, I often refer to Avid as the software that won't die. And the reason for that is there's some things that Avid does really, really well. And there's things that all software does really well. I won't sugarcoat it. There's things I love about Avid. There's things I don't love about Avid that I wish they would take from other software to do even better. And there's some things I love about Premiere. There's some things I like about Final Cut Pro. Avid has a, has a staying power. It is still around and is still used by a lot of the industry. So we're going to talk about it. We're going to explore it. And we're going to look at it. One of the reasons I think it is so popular is because the way that I look at Avid is Avid may not have some of the features that other software has. And the analogy that I sometimes use is other software out there, Premiere, Final Cut Pro, even DaVinci Resolve has an editing system now. This other software may have some great features and may have some great tools and do some things really, really well. And so you can buy different types of cars, right? You can buy different models of cars. You can buy different brands or different companies of cars. You can buy a, a, a Nissan or a, or a Honda or a Ford or a Chevrolet or whatever you want to buy. You can buy a Tesla. You can buy all kinds of different cars in there. And they all have their features and they all do different things. The way that I often sometimes look at Avid, if you, want to, if you want an analogy that kind of speaks to me, and I've talked to other people in the industry about this, is that Avid is like buying an 18-wheeler. Uh, Avid works really, really well with media. And by that, I mean it works really, really well with tons of media, hours of media. So if you're doing a documentary, if you're doing a long-form documentary that needs 600 hours of footage to bring into your system, or you're doing a feature film, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours of footage to make a feature film, and you want to move massive amounts of footage, massive amounts of media, you don't want to do that in a Honda. You want to do that in an 18-wheeler, right? You want to, if you're going to move your entire family and all the furniture in your home, you're not going to just pack it up into your... Ford Escort or whatever it may be. You're going to put that 
into an 18-wheeler, and an 18-wheeler can move massive amounts of stuff. One of the places that Avid really shines, as far as I'm concerned, and for the people I've talked to, is that when you're moving a lot of media, when you're dealing with a lot of footage and a lot of content, Avid handles it really, really well. Of the things they don't do well, there are plenty. But of the things they do really, really well, they handle massive amounts of media really well. And we'll talk about some of the media management ideas and some of the modular ideas of working in bins inside of Avid. But we'll explore it. And there will be some things I say, eh, I wish Avid did this better. But in terms of moving a lot of media, this thing is a massive system and it handles that really, really well. Does it have all the bells and whistles and features? Maybe not. But again, you're going to see this software for a long time. I've been in it for 20 some odd years. I'm still seeing it. It's still popular. I'm still teaching classes in it. It is a software that's going to be around. Don't expect it to go anywhere. It's going to be there for a long time. So let's explore it. Let's learn about it. And let's see how it works. And we'll, you know, find the good in everything. All right. Okay, so we're going to get started here with Avid Media Composer. And I'm going to click the icon on the bottom taskbar there and open this up and wait for Avid to take its sweet time loading up. I do want to show you something when Avid loads up, just as a detail, not really important, but just as a thing. When it first loads up, you'll see this little display in the bottom, this little progress bar showing you different things that are loading up and things that are installing. Um, just keep an eye on this. Um, it's not vitally important, but just keep an eye on this. If for any reason ever, 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 Avid has a problem, Avid does something weird where it freezes up on, say, something like initializing Media Streams Manager, or initializing ABX plugins, or it does something else where it has some problem that just it does, it's not working right or it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, if ever you encounter a problem whatsoever, uh, check that thing. Check where it froze up. This hasn't happened to me in several years, but like, I don't know, five, six years ago, my system kept freezing up and it kept not loading Avid in the middle of doing something. Like it was in the middle of doing something like Media Streams Manager or something else like that. And then that's the thing you Google. That's the thing like, you're like, oh, it says when it's audio core devices, that's when it froze up. Okay, there's something wrong with your sound card and then you can figure out what's wrong. But that little taskbar is really a nice way to kind of just troubleshoot, just check an eye on it. I don't know, I, I guess I'm just burned from that one time that it was giving me problems. Otherwise, it should open up fine and it should be there. Uh, this is the default welcome screen for Avid. This is the selected project screen. Now, some of you know that with other software, one of the things I'll do is I'll click away from this because I, I don't like these welcome screens and I'm very anti-welcome screen. Like, I don't need your help. I will do it myself. Um, in this case, no. Um, in this case, no, we want to work in here. We want to open up with this screen. This is going to be the default location where we're going to load up the project and create a project there. Now, uh, we have a couple things here. There's two sections here. There's the project section, and then there's the new project, which is where you make a new project. So you have projects and new project. Uh, we're going to go to projects, and it asks us first about a user profile. And this is where we can decide on our user. Now, it gives a default user for the computer system, but we can make our own user profile. So we could right click or click here and go to create user profile and say we're going to call this profile chat in this case. Let's call this chat. And it's going to create a new profile for chat. Can change some things, how the interface looks, how it works, but that's basically cool. We're in, we're in a brand new user profile. So if anything wrong ever goes wrong with your user profile, we'll talk about this as we go on. But if everything wrong with your system, sometimes you know resetting, just creating a new user profile is not a bad thing to do and have one specific for yourself. Uh, we're gonna have our projects in a certain location. So I'm gonna uh, assign a certain location. So here it says location. It's on my computer um, desktop. So the desktop is the default location, but I can click this little folder or there's a pull down of frequent locations. We're gonna make a folder here, open up this dialog box and I'm just gonna go to my external drive here and I'll just make a new folder for uh, Avid projects. And so I don't have an Avid Project folder yet, I don't think. And so here, now I have a folder called Avid Projects. And so all my Avid Projects will be in here. You can save this in the desktop. You can save this in your Documents folder. You can save this pretty much anywhere else. But I'm going to have one place where my Avid Projects are going to live. And they're going to be there like so. And inside of here right now in Avid Projects, there's nothing. If I was to go back to the desktop and look at my external drive here, I can go here and scroll up and see Avid Projects. Well, there's nothing in here. So to do that again, we could say, let's just make a project folder on the desktop. So we'll go back in the Avid Media Composer. We'll choose uh, desktop as our location. And on the desktop, we'll make a new folder. We'll call this one Avid Projects. That way it's easier to get to. Now, is the desktop the best place to do this? Not necessarily, but we're just gonna do it here anyway. So again, on the desktop now, 
I have an Avid Projects folder living right here. So this is my Avid Projects folder for the desktop, for stuff I leave. I don't know, I'm doing it for my own sake. I'm doing it for personal reasons, and I'm going to leave it here on the desktop like so. Well, right now we don't have a project, so we haven't made any projects here. So we're going to go to the New Project button. We're going to choose New Project, and it's going to ask us about the project. And so we're going to come up with a project name. I'm going to call this one, um, we're going to call this uh, MinMail. And I'm going to do a thing where I'm going to leave my initials on the end of this. Um, and so just for that, I'm going to put the initials on this. In case, I don't know, I'm doing this again and again, I might have this here. I might put a min hyphen mail or min underscore mail. There we go. There's two underscores, craziness. Um, I want to avoid dashes and periods and stuff like that. Sometimes that gets problematic, but we're going to do, make a project called there. And it's going to make this new project using the Chad user profile, which is incidental. But more importantly, it's going to put it in this location, desktop, avid project. So in here, desktop, avid projects, that's where it's putting this project. So this project called me and Mal, um, uh, CEA, which is my initials. And then I can go in here and I can decide on a format. And so we can talk about formats if you really want to, but there are some presets and presets are your friends. So there is the HD presets, HD 1080, which includes the interlace 1080i's, 1080i 5994, which would be probably broadcast, 1080p 23976, and then some of the other smaller 1080s, 1440, um, and then the 720s. They even have NTSC. NTSC would go back to it was like NTSC 30i would be a 720 by 46. So I don't know if we were editing an old episode of Miami Vice or something, or we were working with archival footage. You might want to work with this archival project in standard definition NTSC or even even PAL if you're working in a foreign country. Uh, there's the 2K resolutions, the Ultra HD resolutions. So there's a whole group of Ultra HDs which are you know, 3840 by 2160, uh, 2Ks, there's different, there's different 2Ks, 2Ks full, 2K, 2K flat, 2K scope, um, different resolutions there. And then with each resolution, you'll see that there's frame rates. So there's 24 frames a second, 23.976, that's a drop frame time code, 30 progressive, 29.97 progressive, um, 4K resolutions, 8K resolutions, and God forbid, there's also 16K resolutions, man, 16K. 16384 by 8640 man that's crazy talk um nobody's really working in 16k yet i mean not yet i think i don't know maybe if you're working on a editing video for a jumbotron in times square or something but i don't know uh it's there just you know and i hate to use the term but future proofing it's a way to go anyway we're gonna make this project in hd 1080p 23.976 and i'm choosing that because that is the footage that i shot that i'm going to use with this project i was shooting all in 1920 by 1080 at 24 frames a second drop frame using the 709 color space so this is all set to all kind of the defaults of how this should be set up and we're going to say create and we're going to create this project and we're going to load up and build a project and it's going to bring us into our kind of default project screen now one of the things that happens here with this new version here of uh adobe sorry of avid media composer is that when it loads this up here um it brings up this bin window in the front here and i kind of sort of wish it didn't do that but it's kind of like saying hey welcome i'm i don't know the i'm the paperclip or something it's just a bin here that says hey i'm a bin i quickly will close this out and get rid of this bin and say goodbye bin um, and so now it's over here so this is the default interface for how avid normally looks so you have uh, a bins area over here this is what's sometimes called the bin sidebar if i go to this bin and i go to the icon right here go to the icon right here and i double click the icon it will load up this bin and so we have this sidebar over here and this bin area over here there's also a tab to go to effects palette which we'll talk about later but here's the bin area over here and then you have this screen here this double screen source record monitor as you always had in every other video editing system you've ever worked on which the source record monitor is called the composer screen make a note of that because a lot of times people forget that this is called the composer Avid will frequently refer to the composer i will refer to the composer and it's there so you have the bin window over here with this little bin sidebar and you have the composer window with this over here and down at the bottom you have the timeline so you have the bin composer and timeline and this is one workspace one interface of way to work um if you see on the side here there's other workspaces here so this is the edit workspace this is designed to be for basic editing you also have the color workspace which would bring up the color correction tools and bring up the the three window composer Effects brings up a one window composer, but also brings up the effect palette and the effect editor and changes some of the buttons down here. And then lastly, audio is another workspace, brings up the audio tool and brings up the audio mixer and brings a, a single screen with a timeline. And this is another way of looking at it. 
for the most part, we're gonna be working in the edit function. We may hop into these other functions and this will be how we're gonna go through. So this is just basically interface as it is. Now, like I said before, we can create bins and we have a bin here. It makes one bin by default. Avid automatically, when you make a project, makes one bin. And I can actually show you this bin. If you go here to the desktop and we go into uh, Avid Projects, which is where it is, min mail CEA, that's what I made today. Um, and inside of here, um, there's a bin here. There's an AVB, min mail underscore CEA bin. So it makes one bin that's normally named after the project. And in Avid, we're going to work in bins. And this is kind of one of the specific differences about Avid versus other video editing systems out there right now. Now, this bin is called MinMailCA, which is the name of the project. So it made a project and made a bin for the project. What we're going to do here is actually we're going to click on this and rename it. Now, I know on, on other computer systems, if you're used to like on your desktop or something, you click on something and then you wait two seconds, and you click on it again, it will let you rename it. Or if you hit the return key, it will let you rename it. Um, in Avid, it is the second you click on something, uh, click on the name of something, it lets you rename. It automatically, no, don't do anything else. Just click on it. It's like, please rename me. Avid is so desperate to rename the names of these bins um, and the files and the clips as well. But mainly the, mainly the bins, man, it just automatically names. Um, I say that because it's really easy, um, uh, but you might not be used to it. But also, um, you'll find that if you double click here like 600 times, like if this bin was closed and you click on the name a thousand times, it's never going to open this. It's never going to open this. You have to double click on the icon to open it. But we're going to take this, we're going to rename this, and we're going to call this sequences. And so this is going to be a bin where I'm going to put sequences. I'm going to put my sequences inside of this bin. So here now I have a sequences.avb. This is the name of this bin. So it made a bin here, an actual physical unit called a sequences.avb. It's built into there. And so now I can make other bins. So if you notice, I can go to File, New, Bin, and I can make another new bin. We'll call this um, a subclips. So this is going to be a place where I'm going to put all my subclips in here. So I have a subclips bin. And again, these bins are open. You can see the icon. They look like little open drawers right now, little drawers. And bins, honestly, bins are kind of like folders. Um, they're kind of like just containers. They're places where you put stuff. Uh, it's called a bin because you know, in the early days of Avid, Avid was trying to I guess kind of kind of uh, appease the the film industry and in film industry if you worked with actual celluloid film they would put those film strips into these paper plastic bins that would keep them protected from hairs and dust and whatever else may attach themselves to the to the actual piece of celluloid plastic uh, and so they had these things called bins and because you know they could have called them containers or boxes or folders or whatever it may be they just decided to call them bins because bins sounded more i don't know filmy i guess and cool. We can have multiple bins here. So we're going to go here. We're going to use a shortcut uh, command N on a Mac or control N on a PC and command N make another bin. We'll call this bin, um, I don't know, sound effects or something. So this is going to be a place where I'm going to put all my sound effects. And I have a separate container here for all my sound effects. And you'll see they're going to load up in a row. Sequences, sound effects, subclips, they're right there in a row like so. Keep using the letter S here. Um, I don't know. We can go and we can, we can right click and go to new bin. So command N will work. New bin will work. Um, you can even go to this little menu up here. Some people call this a little hamburger, but we're going to call this a fast menu because we're going to be proper in fast menu, new bin. We can make another bin and call this, uh, I don't know, something other stuff. Stuff we don't know where to put in this bin. We can have another bin here called other stuff. So some of these bins can be open, some of them can be closed. And you can see the difference between the open and closed icons. The closed ones look like closed drawers, which means there's nothing in there. And the open ones look like open bins there. Now, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to bring some other stuff into these bins here. They're all closed here. We can open them there. Now, we were talking before about the interface and what we were doing with the interface. There's some things we can do with the interface. So say, for example, we didn't like the look of this. We wanted to create a look of this that had a different kind of stylistic look of this. We have the edit workspace, the color workspace, the effects, and audio. And if for every reason you can't ever see this bar, you can go to Windows, Workspaces, and see Effects, Edit, Color, and Audio. Or you could say make a new workspace and we're going to make a new workspace and we're going to call this new workspace. So just for amusement's sake, we're going to call this workspace Premiere because you're a traditional Premiere editor and you love working in Premiere and you want to make a, a workspace that looks like Premiere. So let's see how Premiere kind of designs itself. Now we can't make this look exactly like Premiere, obviously, but there's some things we could do to make this look like Premiere. So we know that there's a little volume meter on the side of your timeline in Premiere. So we're going to go to Tools, Audio Tool. And we're going to bring up the audio tool, which is this little 
floating window over here that looks like this, basically this little floating window. We're going to take this and we're going to drag this over the corner. And you see as I drag this, these little green tabs show up in the corner. So we're going to drag over this green tab until it turns white and put the audio right there. So now we have a little audio tool, a little audio meter display that shows us what the levels are doing there. So now it's starting to look a little bit more like Premiere looks, kind of has a little bit more Premiere style, if you will. Okay, so let's take a look. Let's look a little further. Um, what else would Premiere do? Uh, Premiere has a project window down here. So there's a bit of a project window down here. So we can detach this bins window and let go of this. And then we're going to drag this down to here and put it here. And again, it's going to highlight this green one. And we're going to put it there. And it's going to say, hey, okay, so now we have a project window. We'll make this a little bit smaller. And we have a timeline and kind of a, a project looking window. This feels more Premiere like. But there's also across the top of this in Premiere, there's tabs to go from go from basically your project workspace, which includes bins, and then there's next there's an effects palette, and there's a media library and a, a media thing. So now we want to put the effects. We can't put it up top here. We can't put it next to it up top. But what we can do here is we can say put it on the sidebar right here. And so the way to move this so it goes to the sidebar, because if I do it like this and put it here, it's going to put this to the left of this, and so it's going to have the effects and, the, and I, I don't want it like that. What I want is I want this to be tabable over here, kind of like two different tabs. So I'm going to hold down the option key when I do this. So I'm going to click on the name, holding the option key, and you see it just highlights the little tiny little bar right here. And I put it right there. And now I have bins and effects palette in a row, kind of like there. So I can switch between bins and effects palette, bins and effects palette. And I could put something else in there. Oops, I just clicked the X and lost my effects palette. Let's go back to tools. See that effects palette. Oh, good. Still there. Cool. So now I have this like so, and I'm going to have this. This is my layout. This is how this is how more like Premiere would look. And there's some other things we could do. We could change some other things about how it would look to look like Premiere in terms of the windows. I'd have to remember how Premiere looks and kind of reference some of those things. But now we have this kind of looking more like Premiere. We go to this Premiere and there's a little tiny little triangle right here, this tiny little triangle. We can go to save current, which means, hey, this is now saved in the Premiere way. Now we still can go back and go back to the edit way. This is good old Avid's edit way, but if we want to work like we're working in Premiere, we can work like we're working in Premiere. So if it makes you feel better, you can do that. If you're working in Final Cut Pro or you're working in DaVinci Resolve, you could make a way that looks makes Avid look like that. And so you have different workspaces as they were here. And so you have these different workspaces. There's different kind of review, different ways you can look through here and see these different workspaces as an idea. So you can make workspaces for whatever you want, really. I mean, you can make workspaces for, hey, I'm doing, I'm doing a lot of, uh, I don't know, I'm doing a lot of uh, title work. I'm doing a lot of graphics work and I, and I need my certain things to look a certain way and certain tools to be open and certain um, controls to be available to me so I can work in a, in, a, in, a, in a more graphic kind of way. But you can redesign your entire interface and make it however you want to. Now, right now we have these four bins and these four bins don't really have anything in them. So we can't really appreciate them for all their glory of what they are. So we're gonna bring some bins in and I wanna talk about this as an idea. This is gonna be a little bit complicated, but we're gonna talk about this as an idea of how Avid works modularly. And by that, I mean, it works with bins. Normally with other editing systems, and not to compare, but you know, I guess we're going to compare uh, with other video editing systems, you get stuff where like, like Premiere, for example, is project based. When you make Premiere, you make a Premiere project. The way that Avid works is, is what it considers this project. I made this project called MinMail CA. This is just a folder. It's just a container. When I save this and I hop back into here, you'll notice here that I have this and inside of here, I have these bins. I have a, a an other stuff bin and a sequences bin and a sound effects avid video bin dot avb and a subclips bin. And these things, this stuff is where I make stuff. And so the way I often think about this is imagine that you own a filing cabinet, right? You own a filing cabinet, a metal filing cabinet it sits in your closet somewhere and you have a filing cabinet and it's great. It has all your files inside of there are little containers, little folders or little partitions which hold your stuff. The filing cabinet is incidental. It's not like it's a, it's a gold plated filing cabinet that's really important. The filing cabinet is just, a, it's just a holder. And it's a holder for the stuff that's really important. What's the important stuff? The stuff that's in the folders, the stuff that's in the containers or in the partitions, that's the bins. And so I often say, you know, if, if for example, like your house was on fire and you only had like 30 seconds to run back in your house and grab the important stuff, you wouldn't, 
grab a hand truck and bring the entire filing cabinet outside. You'd open up the filing cabinet and bring stuff in or out of there. And so what happens is inside of Avid, it says, hey, this whole container, I don't really care about this as much. I mean, there, there's some important things in here. There's a settings file and a JSON file and a setter. But this is it. This, these four things, the bins, this is where I'm doing the work. This is what I'm making and this is where I'm doing the work. And so this is where I'm putting stuff like sequences. This is where I'm putting stuff like clips, audio files, effects, graphics. Everything gets put into here. Everything gets built into these things. And these things... I can just say, and a lot of people will do this when they work, they say, hey, I'm not gonna keep all this. When I wanna make a backup of this project, I'll just make a backup of the bins. And so it's kind of more you know, modular. And the nice thing about this is, is that if you're working with someone else and you say, hey, I wanna give you this latest thing that I'm working on. So you know, I say in here, hey, I'm working on this, I'm working on this intro, this sizzle reel for Mike. I don't know who Mike is, but we're gonna say here, we're gonna make a new bin and we're gonna call this sizzle, for Mike. And so this is gonna be the sizzle for Mike. So this stuff I can have of just the sizzle reel that I have for Mike. And so inside here, when I wanna send this to Mike, I just go, hey, send this one thing to Mike, not the whole project. I was working on a whole bunch of things. I don't need to send all of this. I just need to send this one, one, one container, this one Avid video bin. So I have all my stuff in this one tiny little container that I can send to another person. And that's so much cooler. Um, it allows for a lot of creative workflow ideas. So for example, one of the things I'm going to do is I have this folder with bins. And these bins are related to some media that I have on my drive. So inside of my drive over here, I have in my drive, I have some media loaded in here. And these bins are basically referencing that media. Now, I just made four or five new bins here for today. But in those four or five new bins that I made, I did not put anything in those bins. We will later. But for now, I didn't put anything in those bins. And they're kind of empty and they're kind of boring. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab these bins and give these bins to this other project. So I stole these bins from somebody else. And I have the media for them. So it references the same media. But now I'm going to say I'm going to take this, copy this, command C or edit copy copy three items, and I'm going to put it into this bin. So we're going to go here and hit command V and edit paste. And now I have this music interviews and B-roll. And this was made two years ago. So these are other bins that I have from two years ago. Now, here's a trick. When I go in an Avid, you're going to hope to see these bins right here. And they're not there. You don't see them. They don't exist. They're not there. Sorry. No big look. And I wish there was, and this is a, 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 a issue for me. Maybe there is, I just don't know about it, but I wish there was a way that I could copy these in here and they would automatically refresh and say, hey, I found these are the bins. What do you want to do with them? I tend to find that the easiest way for me to do this is to go here and go to file and close project. Command shift W. I'll use command shift W often and close the project and close the project, which will bring me back out to the welcome screen. And the welcome screen will say, hey, select a project. And now look, I have now, since I made this project, I now in this desktop avid projects i have this min mail cea project 1080p 23.976 with a frame rate of 24 frames per second drop frame and has all this project here and then i'll just jump back into it so i just jumped out for a second just to jump back into it and now when i jump back into it oh look the b-roll is here the interviews is here the music is here those three bins weren't there before and i just grabbed them now there's two ways of doing this um so i'm going to go here and i'm going to say let's take these and let's delete these bins. I don't want these bins anymore. Um, and if I delete these bins, I'm going to highlight them all. So I clicked on the first one, shift click on the third one. I'm going to get rid of these bins and, and get rid of them. It actually takes the liberty of putting this into a little trash folder. It puts in a little trash folder and says, hey, you owned these bins. Are you sure you want to delete them? I'm not really sure. Let me make sure. Well, I can go in here in trash folder. I can bring them back. I could drag them back in or I could trash them entirely. But in this case, I'm going to trash them entirely. I'm going to go to this fast menu. And I'm going to say empty trash. And now they're gone. And now you see here, man, these bins that were here before, and he, they're gone. They don't exist anymore. So one thing I could do, say, for example, somebody said, hey, I have this music. I want to give you this music. It's my music, but I want you to see what I did and what music I chose. I want to bring this bin in here. So one of the things you could do is you could say inside of Avid Media Composer, file, open bin. And we could find this bin. And so we could go here to the desktop. We go to... Uh, MIC bins, and we say, oh, bring in the music bin. When we do that, it's kind of like we're borrowing it from somebody. We're kind of saying, hey, we are borrowing this bin, and we're just going to use it for a second, or we're just going to peek at it and use it. And it puts in this folder here. It actually makes a little folder here. This is an icon for a folder. 
we'll talk about folders, and made, made a folder here called bins, and made this other bins folder. And so now we have this other bins folder, and inside of here, it makes music. Avid does this. Avid makes this other bins folder, and it's basically Avid's way of saying, hey, you don't own this. This is not for you. And so this is not here for you. And now when you delete this, it won't go into a trash folder. It just goes out of your use. So now I'll do this again. I'll go to file, open bin, and I'm saying, hey, I'm opening a bin that doesn't belong to me. I'm grabbing it from this folder here called MMIC 20 bins, and I bring this in here, and I say, cool. And just like, hey, now I can grab this. I can work with this. I can use this, etc. I could duplicate this, anything I want to do, but I don't really own it. So again, if I delete this bin, it's still there. It's still here. I just didn't, I didn't delete it because it wasn't mine in the first place. It's not in my project folder. And so that's the thing you can do. The other thing you can do is what we did before, which is where we said, let's grab these, copy and paste this. And now we're making new copies of this. So we're not touching this, but now we could delete these out of here. If it's in the same project, we can basically delete them out of here and we can bring that stuff into there. So that said, now we're going to go back and add it. But again, it's not going to show up. It's like, oh, where are those? I just put those bins in there. But Avid needs to refresh. So Command Shift W, Control Shift W on a PC. We're going to say close the project, and we're going to hop back into here. And now they're there. So now let's take a look at these bins and what these bins have and what's basically going on inside these bins. So let's look, for example, at these uh, B-roll bin. And we're going to double click and open up the B-roll bin. The sizzle for Mike is the only bin that's open, but we're going to double click and open up the icon for the B-roll bin. And now we see this B-roll. And so now we have some B-roll here. We can make this bin super wide and we can see some of this here and we have this uh, b-roll display so um, there's a couple different ways of looking at this footage uh, the default way is over here this little button right here that says text view and text view gives us some basic text information about the files it tells us what the names of the file is what the duration of the file is what drive it's on so the media itself is on a certain drive it tells us what tracks has a video one, audio one, audio two tracks, gives us some basic information about that. Now, this is called text view. In text view, there's a couple of different ways of looking at text view. We can get into some advanced features, but for now, there's this little pull down that tells us we can look in basic. Basic tells us the name, the start, the end, the duration, the tracks, and the video format. There is capture, which tells us some the name, the start, the duration, the tracks, whether it's offline or not, which is nice and the video format, as well as the drive. Um, there's something here called film. Film is fascinating. I don't do a lot of work with classical celluloid film, but the ink number, the pull in and the pull out, the sound time code, the lab roll, the cam roll, all this kind of crazy information about this file. Whew, this is interesting stuff. Uh, the one that I like here, so this format, media tool, and there's one here called statistics. I don't know why, I just, I grew up on statistics. Statistics made the most sense to me. But if I want to see what the detailed information about this is, I want to see the names of these files, I want to see the duration of these files, I can search through here and see how long these files are on or what drive they're on or when they were created, et cetera. And I can see the media in this capacity. This is what's called text view. So sometimes you want to look at information. You want to look at detailed information. You, you, know, you want to nerd out and see what the detailed information is or how long a clip is, and you want to look at there. And that is called text view. The next view over here is called uh, frame mode. And frame mode here gives us little pictures. And this is what we saw before. We have a little picture. All we have is little icons, picture icons, and the name of the file. So we have the picture icon, and we have the name of the file here. And so we can look through here, and we can see the picture icons of what these are. Now, inside of here, we have a couple features. Um, I can grab these files, and I can move them around. So I could, you know, drag, grab these three files, and move them around and move them over here. And I could grab, and now it's kind of going off screen here. So I can grab these files and move them over here and kind of move them over here and organize. And if I want a storyboard, like I want to say, oh, I want this file first and then this file. And I can kind of make a make an organizational kind of chart for myself of how I want these files laid out. I can kind of, you know, decide what order these files should be in and kind of, you know, visualize in my head kind of a storyboard here, there. Um, and so I have those controls to do that thing there. Uh, also, one of the things I do like is that if I go to the fast menu, again, this is the this is the bin fast menu. So the bin fast menu, little hamburger here, go to the little hamburger. I can uh, go down to align and fill, fill window. Um, and so align and fill, fill window automatically just cleans everything up and tries to fit everything into one screen. So if my screen is bigger or my screen is differently shaped or something like there, and it looks like this, it's gonna be like, hey, I don't wanna have to scroll to get through this. 
So cool. Let's go here to align and fill, fill window, and this will clean this up great. It'll try to fit everything on the screen that it can and make it there. So if it's like this, my window's like this, and it's a great big mess. Here, align and fill, fill window. And so you have this, align and fill, fill window. Which also brings the case that we can also go up to here in frame mode, and we can say this little slider will make these frames bigger. And so we can make these frames bigger. And if you make them super huge, you know, there's only so much space you can have. We can have all this on the screen, so it's going to limit you in some capacity. But we can move this here and have this like there, and make this bigger or smaller. Uh, because I love shortcuts, I will give you some shortcuts for this. Uh, traditionally, um, this used to be Command L for larger, so hold down Command L, or if you're on a PC, Control L to make these larger, or Command K for cut smaller. Well, I mean, Command S was already taken. Command S is always save, right? It's always, and every program, it's always save. So Command S for smaller. So Command K for smaller. Or I guess, I don't know, if you're German, if you're German, you know the German word for small? It's Klein. Klein. So you have Command L for larger, or Command K for Klein. It, it was just because it was next to L. So you can use L and uh, K and L to make Command K, Command L to make this larger and smaller. And so you can make these frames bigger there. But they'll go up to this size, and they'll go smaller up to this size, like so. Um, in addition to there, in some things, if we go to this interviews clip, um, you'll notice um, that this window will pop up. And this is the thing that will show up here um, that will pop up like this, and it looks like this. And let me show this to you as an idea. I'm going to open this up wide. I'm going to take these two files. I'm going to put them over here in the corner. I'm going to take these two files. I'm going to put them over here, and we're just going to scroll down further. We'll actually even open this up like this, and we'll bring these all the way down here to this corner here. Um, and we'll take this guy and put him over here. Uh, that will actually open this super wide. That's as wide as we can go. So take this, maybe move this over here, just to there. Cool. All right. So now, if I make this smaller, you'll see inside of here, um, Abbott added this new thing in 2020. Uh, where they added this control, this is called a bin map. And if you've ever played a video game, if you've ever played Legend of Zelda, you can know you can go to the map screen. In the map screen, you can go, -na 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 -na, and you can kind of look through here and look where your files are in the bin. So if your files are all, all over the bin, it gives a little kind of heads up map that lets you look through the files and look through there. Um, I have mixed feelings about the bin map. Uh, some people love the bin map. I guess a lot of video game players like this idea that they can look through their files and kind of just search through there. Uh, I think the bin map just gets in the way. It just gets in the way of the files and I can't see them. So easy enough, I can go to the fast menu and go to the fast menu and say, hey, I don't want the bin map. Um, let's go to hide bin map. My bin map, boom, goes away. And now the bin map's gone. So if you like the bin map, cool. I'm not a fan of the bin map. I'm going to use uh, a line and fill and fill window. And that's going to be a nice, cleaner way for me to work. Now let's go back to B-roll for a second, and I want to show you this. Um, right here on this one clip here, if I zoom in a little closer, this one clip right here called 4101 here, this clip that I have here looks like nothing. It looks, I mean, argumentatively, it looks like nothing. And we don't really have anything going on that we can really appreciate here, so we're not really looking at anything worthwhile that we can see. So uh, how do we change this? And this is what's sometimes called changing the representative frame. Well, one way of doing this would be with the one, two, three, and four keys. So the three and four keys are going to be go, go frame forward, go frame backward. So four is forward, three is backward. And we can click on this clip and we can four, we can kind of go a frame forward, which is limited. Um, it moved a little bit, um, kind of, kind of, sort of. There. Um, one and two is go eight frames forward, go eight frames backwards. So if we hit two, we can go massively forward and we can update this frame. Because of some of my playback issues, I'm clicking away from this. And now I see, okay, this is a picture of this poster. So if, the, if you want a better frame, if you wanted a better frame to look at, you can use one, two, three, and four. Um, and you can look there. So if you wanted this, like this poster to be more in the center, you could click on this one, hold down two, and we kind of advance forward until it's there. And so we can kind of advance this and change the representative frame of these things. And so we can use one, two, three, and four. I'll show you another way in a little bit on how to do that. Um, there's some other techniques of how to do that. But for now, one, two, three, and four is one frame backward. Three and four is one frame backward, one frame forward. And then one and two is eight frames forward, eight frames backward. Etc. And when you close the bin, if you close the bin and then you open it back up again, those changes have been re re retained. So those changes are still there. It's still doing the same thing. It still looks and works the same.
Now, um, Avid offers a third way, a third mode of looking at this. So we talked about text mode. We talked about frame mode. And lastly, there's an option called script mode. And script mode um, basically gives you, tries to give you the best of both worlds. So in the one version, we had the pictures. In the other version, we had all the text information. Well, now we have both. We have all the pictures. We have all the text information. It's great. We have everything. We have all, we have all this stuff and all this stuff. This is called script mode. And this is our third way of looking at this footage here in text, frame, script mode. Now, the challenge of this is that working in script mode causes some problems. And the problem being is that when I'm working here, I take up some vertical space this way because I'm working here with um, images. And I, the, the bigger these images, the more vertical space it's going to take up. It's also taking up horizontal space because the text coming across is going to take up some a lot of horizontal space here, which is going to be a problem. So that's there's some limitations. There's going to be some issues here. Well, Avid decided that since it takes up such vertical space, um, and takes up such, such horizontal space, there's no way you're not gonna be scrolling. Like if you have like more than five clips, you're gonna end up scrolling to get through all the stuff. There's there's no way to fit it all in the one frame because it takes up a lot of space to put both the text and both the pictures in there. Well, I haven't decided that, hey, if you're gonna take up the space, why not put a text box in here? Why not put a text box in here that says, hey, we can click on here and type in, uh, this footage is out of focus. It's not, my fault, blame Steve. And now you can put a note for some other editor about something it is. Hey, go to this clip and say, hey, uh, you know, the director wants to end with this shot. And so you can leave notes, you can leave it there. It's called script mode because literally, if you have a screenplay or a teleplay or something or some kind of a transcription, you can literally copy and paste the, the, the text. So this will write lines upon lines of text inside here. It's actually a fully functioning text box that can scroll in fully functioning text box. And so you can write all these kind of lines in there and have this inside here. So you can write all this stuff. So if, you ha if you're doing work as an assistant editor or you are an assistant editor or you just like to be super organized, you can have all of that there. And so that is uh, text view, frame view, and script view. I work, honestly, personally, I work a lot less than script view. I tend to be in text view and frame view, but sometimes, sometimes it's nice. So there's our three views of working. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that inside of here, with any of this footage here, um, you have the sidebar. You can hide the sidebar if you don't want to see it. You just want to get rid of it. Um, but you can open the sidebar up and see it. Some other things you can do is if you grab a different bin. So say, for example, I had the sequences bin. Sometimes I'll do this. If I have a sequences bin tabbed here next to the interviews bin, if I click and grab and pull this, I can detach this. So now it's a floating bin. So in case I had like a separate screen or something, I could bring this over to another screen and put this on a separate screen. I have dual monitor, triple monitor there. What I could also do is I could actually grab it here and I could have a split. I like this idea, have a split. So now I have um, two different areas here. I have kind of this bin space and this bin space in case I'm dragging files from one bin to another and I really wanna organize bins. I could have you know, some kind of weird organization this way of having two separate zones. You know, Maybe one of these has the sidebar, one of them doesn't, but either way I have that there. And so I can have this as a separate entity like so instead of just tabbed over from each other which still works but it's a little different and then in addition i can i know this is weird but i can in fact um go to the fast menu or right click and make a folder so new folder and i could call this say for example day one and then make another new folder and call the new folder day two in case i had a, a day one and a day two you know i had these broken out as separate days of doing separate materials so then I can grab all these bins and then put them into day one, and now I have a separate day one and day two. And this will reflect back out on the desktop. So if I go back here to Avid Projects, inside Avid Projects, Min Mail, you'll see now I have a day one, and all my bins are here in a day one. So this, this will all relate back out to the desktop interface. And so I have all of this stuff here to make these projects. Okay, the last thing I want to get into in with this is a little bit different than projects, but this is basically setting up and working inside of settings. So we looked at these files, we can grab these files, we can we can rename these files. If I go in here to my B-roll footage, I could say, oh, this B-roll here, let's look in frame view here. And I could say, um, this is, this is, uh, let's see, this is the Rutgers table, 7601, we'll call this Rutgers table. 
Now, this won't name the source media. We'll talk about that later, but this won't name the source media. Um, we'll call this one uh, handing paper. Uh, call this one uh, poster on table. So we have that there. And so we have, we can rename these. We can work with these there. We can have these bins here. And again, these bins are changes I've made inside of here. And when I close this, it will automatically save this. When Avid saves, Avid is not saving the project. So when you hit Command S, if you go to File Save, you'll notice it doesn't say, say it's a save bin. The only thing it wants to save is bins. And so here you'll see a little asterisk next to the uh, B-roll bin. That means it, something has changed. I renamed something or I did something since it last saved. When I save this, it will automatically save. If I go to this clip and I say, um, I don't know, guy talking. Okay, I have an asterisk there again. So this has changed since I last saved this. But now if I close this, it's going to auto save when I close these. Every time I close it, it just says, I'm going to save for you. I'll take the liberty of saving for you. And so it does those kind of things. Okay, so the last thing to get into is I'm going to get into a little bit of settings. Um, in a normal circumstance, I can go to File, Settings. That is Command, Shift, Equal, or Control, Shift, Equal, if you're on a PC. Um, in Avid, on a Mac, you also have Avid Media Composer Preferences, which is Command, Comma, which I never use, but you still have preferences here. Preferences and File, Settings, same thing. But I do want to talk about some of these settings as they are and kind of go over some basics of what the settings look like and some ideas of settings, some things you may want to set up before you start working. So we're going to go here to settings and we're going to bring up the settings dialog box. And so there's four areas of settings. There's format, project, user, and site. Uh, format's really basic. Format is if you want to change the format of this project. Now we made this project 1080p, so we made it 1920 by 1080. That's the pixel resolution. And we made it 23.976, which is what's known as 24 frames per second drop frame. Um, you can choose a different resolution if you wanted to. So if you want to make this 16K, you can go to 16K. The only limitation for now, the only limitation in this is that you're going to be working with the same frame rate. When you make a project, a project conforms to a frame rate. And that's really important. You can bring in other stuff from other frame rates. We can bring in other footage that's higher frame rates and lower frame rates, and we will. But when you make a project, that project conforms to that frame rate. So you're going to see that now there's less options. On the 2K options, there's only 2K, 23.976. All the other ones are grayed out. So you only have 23.976 as your thing. But you can change the format if you want to. In this case, we don't want to change our format. We want to leave it alone. We're going to go to project. And project has about about a dozen, maybe 10 or so um, different settings we can look at. And we can look at some of these and what some of these, what they do. We can look at the audio project settings and we can see some ideas of what the bit depth is. We can look at what the bit depth of this product. We're working in 24 bit right now. Um, what hardware it's using to do the audio interface. Some of those settings we can adjust. We're not gonna look at all the settings. We can look at some of the settings. The one I really wanna look at is the general setting. In the general setting, this is a project general setting. Double click that name and it opens this up and says, hey, Here's some questions it has. Does NTSC have setup? You know, those kind of questions, etc. The one that's really important to me is the default starting time code. And the default starting time code here is at 010000. What does that mean? Well, that means that when you make a project and you say take a clip and put it down to the timeline, for example, and you have a sequence, your sequence starts with a time number of 010000. That means when I'm at 0133712 here, I'm three minutes and 37 seconds into 01. And that's, that means it's only, it's not, it hasn't played back an hour in three minutes. It's only played back three minutes or three minutes and 37 seconds and 12 frames. Why the heck does it do that? Like, what is that about? Um, well, it's a weird idea and it's kind of an old fashioned idea. Command shift equal. We're going to go to project general settings. And you might know on other editing systems or even with your camera, if you set up your time code, your time code starts at zero, 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 zeros across the board. And so everything starts at zero, zero, zero. And that would be if you want to set it at zero, 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 the time code would start at all zeros. So why does Avid start at 01, 00, 00? Why, does, why is that the default? And so the reason why that's the default is from kind of a concept about working with multiple footage or working with multiple tapes, actually. I think it goes back to tape. So if you were doing an episodic television show and you had footage on a tape, um, you'd have episode number one. 
And what you would do in a, in a traditional classic linear environment is you would pre-slate the tape or you would pre-black the tape with uh, a time code. And the time code wouldn't start at zero. The time code would start at 01, 00. That way, if the label was wrong or you put the tape in the wrong box or whatever, when you put it into the VCR, the tape would read 01, 00, 00, 00, and you knew you were on tape number one. And if you had episode number two, you would start that with 02, Oh, 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 that way, every time you put the tape in there, you'd know that the, the, the hour marker, since no, none of the tapes were more than an hour long, you'd set the first, the second tape at, or the third tape at 03, oh, 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 oh. And that way you knew that you were within the time, the 59, 59 minutes of tape three or episode three or whatever, or scene three or whatever it was, you'd have separate tapes. You know, even if you're shooting like hours upon hours of B-roll and you had like 16 tapes of B-roll, you could set these each with their own hour marker so you knew which tape you were on. That's a concept. If you don't want to do that, if you if that's confusing to you, you can set your time code at zero, 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 zero. Zeros across the board, like other editing systems or like your camera does where it sets zero. But for this kind of workflow thing, if you're not doing anything longer than an hour, setting the hour marker is there. I know some people who will set their time code to 59.20.00. So that's 59 minutes and 20 seconds oh, which that sounds crazy. Why would you do such a thing? Why would you set your time code to 59 minutes and 20 seconds oh? Well, here's the thing. You're going to set your time code to 59.20, and then maybe you put in 30 seconds of color bars before you're beginning your project. That's going to take you 59.20 to 59.50. Then you're going to go add 10 seconds of black. So it's going to be 30 seconds of bars, 10 seconds of black. So you're going to go 5920 to 5950, and then 5950 to 01000. That way you know that when your time code reads 0104, you're four minutes into your sequence, right? If you have to pre slate it, subtract from an hour the, the, the footage you have to pre slate, whether it be color bars or a counter or some kind of a logo or whatever. Um, you know your actual content, like the actual content starts at 01, 00. Uh, if you could go into negatives, that would make sense, but you can't. So you have to go to one hour minus that. So you, a lot of people would do that thing where they'd set their time code. You know, if it's, if it's a minute of color bars, if the broadcast network requires a minute of color bars, you'd go to 59, then minus another 10 seconds. So that'd be 58.50, and you could set your time code there. But that's just a trick. It's just a trick to say, oh, I work with students a lot of times who say, oh, you know, my project needs to be four minutes long. Does that include color bars in black? No, no, it never includes color bars. It's, it's, it's four minutes long from fade up to fade out. And so they can rewind back and then their counter, they know when they're at 01, 04, they're four minutes into their thing and they've completed their project. And so you could do that. We're going to set this here just to be making my life easier. We're going to set this at all zeros and have it there. Uh, but this is a project based setting, which means when I make another project and a brand new project, I still have to go in here into the general settings and reset this. So these project settings are project based. So it refers to not who the user is, I made a separate user called um, Chad, it doesn't care who the user is, it's going to be based on the project, the project that I made. Next, though, I have user settings, and there's a lot more user settings. There's tons and tons of user settings. There's a whole gamut of user settings that we can look at and we can explore. So here's a whole mess of user settings that look kind of interesting and look kind of cool. Um, let's look at some of them. We're not going to look at all of these. Take days to look at all these. I don't even know if I've looked at all these. Uh, let's look at the bin settings. In the bin settings, it asks some important questions. Okay, auto save interval. How often do you want this computer to save a backup copy of all of your bins that you've been working on? Right now, it's set to every 15 minutes. So every 15 minutes, it's going to auto save here. If you if you find yourself that you crash a lot, you have a mediocre computer, you can set this to five minutes. I'm going to leave mine at 15. I think 15 is an okay. I'll save myself. I'll take care of that. It also has in here an inactivity period. How often... So here's the thing that happens, and sometimes in software, it happens to me in Adobe After Effects sometimes, where I'm in the middle of doing something, and all of a sudden a window pops up that says, hey, let me auto-save for you. And I'm like, don't auto-save right now. I was in the middle of doing something amazing and brilliant and profound. Don't, don't go through and save on me right now. Well, it says, okay, okay, I won't save on you. How long do you want me not to be touching the system? So this is the inactivity period. If you, if you get up and go to the bathroom, if you go get up and get a cup of coffee, how long do you want me to sit here before you save? And we say the inactivity period is 15 seconds. But every, we're going to change this to every 60 minutes, I'm going to save. So I'm going to save every 60 minutes for sure. So every hour, it, 
I don't care if I'm in the middle of doing something. I don't care if I'm in the middle of playing something for the most important director in the world. Save me. If I haven't, if an hour has gone by and I haven't saved my bins, just save me a backup copy. Inter- interrupt me. So this is a, a nice feature. There's some other questions in here that we can explore, we can look at, but this for me is a really important one. This is the one I mostly care about in terms of here. Let's look at composer settings. In composer settings, remember, this is the composer window. So this is the settings for the composer. Composer settings, um, it asks us in the window here, data display on top. What, right now it has one row of data on top. We're going to put two rows of data on top. Say so, okay, and now there's two rows. Of, I like this better. This is two rows of data up here. In composer settings, we're going to look at button display at bottom. Right now it has one row of buttons on the bottom. Why More buttons is better. Cool. Two rows of buttons on the bottom. I like that. That's 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 important to me. That's there. Um, some of you will see the interface setting. The interface setting, I think, is relatively important. Interface setting is how do you want this thing to look? How do you want the interface to look? Right now, we're in kind of a, a dark mode. We can go darker. We can go to super dark. Hit apply. Oh, that's cool. We can go to light mode here, a little bit lighter. I might stay in lighter mode. It might be easier for you to see some of the things in the screen if it's a little bit lighter. So we'll go to lighter mode and see this there. Um, automatic number lock activated, those kind of questions. So there's some questions there. We can also decide on the interface thing. So there's a control here that says bin. It's a little hard to see. A little dark for a second. In bins, you'll see a bin section. So bin icon and text brightness, bin highlight brightness. Well, if we go here to a little bit brighter, Let's see, let's go to bins. We'll make this icons, we'll make the bin. So the bin icons and the thing a little bit brighter. We'll go here and say, make this a little bit brighter. Apply and this, okay, it makes it whiter. I want I want darker, I think. I want, yeah, okay. So I can read these there. I can have these like there. Um, bin container sidebar type of font. Font size for all bin container sidebars. Well, this is really small. My old eyes are getting a little challenged to read. So I'm gonna change this to 18. Make this a little bit bigger. Cool, I can really see this it's really big. Cool. Um, override all bin font sizes. We're going to go to bin font sizes and say override all bin font. We'll make this 18 as well. Now we can really see the names of these people. Lisa, Fidel, Wayne, etc. We can see all the bins. They're there. Timeline. We can make the timeline buttons darker or brighter. So let's see. Let's take a look here. Let's see what the buttons look like. If we make the timeline buttons brighter, how do they look? Well, that's better. I like that better. Yeah, cool. We can even change the custom timeline background. We could choose, I don't know, like a shade of purple here. Fancy. I don't know if you want to do that. You should work with a person who used to make all these kind of crazy colors in the background. Let's just say none, and we'll just go back to good old-fashioned boring gray. That's a little bit more, a little bit more my speed, I guess. So we have those controls. So that's the interface settings. One of my favorite settings, I'll show you a really quick interface setting under the general settings. And this is interface. Um, is something called show tooltips. And show tooltips are relatively simple. Show tooltips say, when I hover over a button, it tells me what the name of the button is. So this is the play button. This is the play into out button. This is the mark in button. This is the mark out button. It tells me the name of the button there. But what I really love, I think this is crazy. Delay 0.5 seconds before showing. Why does this matter? Why did somebody care enough? Why did somebody care enough to say, no, I want to set this to, I don't like having to wait a half a second. I want this to come up right now. And so they really want, as soon as you hover over the button, it's going to tell you what the button is. So now it's going to tell you automatically. Notice before it delayed like a half a second there, but that was too long. I'm too impatient. I can't wait. You can set this to two seconds. And now when you say, okay, now you can hover over the button, wait, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, boom, it shows up. It makes you wait two seconds. Apparently that was like vital to somebody. Somebody was like, nope, I need to know exactly how long, 0.7 seconds before it shows me what the tooltip is because of the things I care about when editing, that's what's, that's what's really important to me. That's really vital to me. So those are some settings. Now, all those settings, all those user settings, save with this user profile, which means these are settings that are defined as Chad settings, and I can have these settings. And if I want to, all these user settings, and we'll talk about tons of other user settings. There's tons of settings in here, some of which I haven't even played with, but all these settings, even the even the Premiere workspace was set up as Chad setting. I can say uh, here, export this user or user profile, and I can export this, throw this onto a thumb drive, and then bring it with me to any Avid. And then that Avid will work just like mine. So I can set up my own way of working anytime I want to. We'll go a step further here. Right now, 
I'm going to go to here and I'm going to go to something else. This is going to be a third thing. Uh, tools. And we're going to go to something called the command palette. And the command palette, shortcut command three, if you want to remember that, brings up this thing called a command palette. And the command palette shows me every single button that Avid offers. So it has all the move buttons, all the play buttons, all the edit buttons, the trim buttons, effects, 3D, color correction, multicam, tracks, smart tools, the other buttons. Didn't even know what to call these buttons, so I just called them other. And then it ran out of space in the other section and made more. So here's the other buttons and the more buttons. Man, there's tons of buttons here. All these buttons. This is every button that Avid offers, including workspace, workspaces and plugins. It's insane. They're eventually going to make like a and then some column when they run into buttons. So we can explore all these buttons in here. And right now, this command palette is set to button to button reassignment. This is in the bottom corner here, button to button reassignment. And now we're going to start mapping some buttons. So I want on my timeline, on my timeline right here, there is no, um, there is no marker. I want a marker on my timeline. So I'm going to go to the more buttons and add this pink marker button to button. I'm going to just drag this here and put this on my timeline. On my source clip, um, so I have a, a marker here on my clip and I have a marker here there. On my source clip though, I'm going to go to the effects and I'm going to add the motion effect editor here in the source clip. I like this. I like the motion effect editor to be here as a source clip thing. Under the edit category, I'm going to go to the edit controls and I'm going to do top and tail. I'm going to put them right here and here. I love top and tail. We'll talk about what these buttons do later, but I really like top and tail as an idea. I like this here. Uh, on the source clip, I'm also going to use make sub clip, and I'm going to put this as a button right here. So I can remap all of my buttons to anything that I want it to be and everywhere I want it to go. And so I have those options there. In addition, I can also go here and choose instead of button to button reassignment, I can choose menu to button reassignment. So I like having the audio mixer readily available for me. Um, the audio mixer is here under tools, audio mixer and there is no shortcut for it so there's not a shortcut immediately available for it and so i'm going to choose menu to button reassignment and under menu to button reassignment i'm going to click here on the timeline and i'm going to so i'm going to click menu to button reassignment choose menu to button reassignment and the next step would be to click a space and it's going to highlight this space right here you see this little space it's just got highlighted right here now i'm going to go to tools audio mixer and just put the audio mixer right here as a button so now anytime I want to, I want to bring up the audio mixer, I can click here and it will bring up the audio mixer automatically. So if there's something you want to use, I can click here, watch this, I can go to tools, command palette, menu to button reassignment, click here and add the command palette to a button. So now I don't have to pull down to go to command palette or I don't have to hit command three, I'll never remember that. I can just go to here and hit command palette and close this. And it can open up the command palette anytime I want to. You'll notice that when the command palette's open, it won't let you click on buttons. If you ever see like, hey, I can't click on a button. Why can't I click on this button and make this play? Or I can't rewind or anything else. I can't use any of these tools. That's because when the command palette is up and it's active, it says, hey, it seems like you want to move buttons around. Well, I'm not going to let you, you know, do anything else because I'm, I'm, I'm ready to move buttons around. So now I can move all these, so I can do button to button reassignment, I can do menu to button reassignment, and I can put any menu item I want on here or any, any menu, any item to replace any button that's there. Let's go a step further in the settings. So here, if you don't have the settings up, again, the trick would be, let me close this down, uh, command shift equal, um, and bring up the keyboard settings. So here's the keyboard settings. Let me open this up for a sec. So here's the keyboard and the keyboard is nice because it shows you all the buttons that you would use in the keyboard. And so now we have all the buttons that exist on the keyboard um, that's there. And so you see oh, one and two are eight frames forward, eight frames backwards. So we do see that as a control here and three and four, are one frame forward and one frame backward. And we weirdly five is also the play button. So you have space bar play, but you also have five as a play button. Who knew? That's crazy talk. And so now we can do menu to button or we can do uh, button to button reassignment on the keyboard. So on three and four, on, on, I'm uh, sorry, not on three and four. On I and O, we have mark in and mark out. So mark in and mark out are here on I and O. They're also here on E and R. I never understood why. I guess maybe if you're left handed, but I'm, it still doesn't make sense to me. I never had a good reason for it. Um, so E and R is kind of pointless to me. But what I really like, as I mentioned before, is I really like that top and tail button. We're going to talk about the top and tail button. I'm going to put the top and tail on E and R. So I'm going to drag top to E, and I'm going to drag tail to R. 
and move that to there. And so now those buttons are there. And I really like those buttons as an idea. Um, they're really cool to me and I really appreciate those buttons. Next to here, um, let's see other buttons I don't care for. Um, the H button is focus. Um, the focus button is okay. It's if you have something in the timeline. So theoretically, if you have a clip in the timeline, you can hit the H key. Hold on, let me close this. And you can sort of zoom in and zoom out. Um, it allows you the function to zoom in and zoom out. To, you know, a quick zoom in and quick out. I, I, I'm i sure it's a great button. I never use it. So let's go to keyboard settings. Let's go to command palette, which I have a shortcut for. And let's just change that to, I don't know, something else more useful. We'll change that to add edit. We're going to edit and we're going to add an edit for H. So H is going to be add edit button. Boom. And you can have that as your add edit button. So that's cool. Okay, cool. A uh, key that I don't like at all. Um, this makes no sense to me. There's two keys. There's mouse jog and mouse shuttle. That is the N key and the semicolon key. Um, mouse jog. Who? Um, that what happens is, is when you use that key, when you hit the letter N, it actually changes your cursor into a slider, um, which will play through your clip. So if you hit N, now, as you roll forward, you can roll forward back and forth through the clips. I'm just sliding the mouse across the table. And you can roll back and forth. If you have like a touchpad or um, or some kind of a like a like a trackball, I guess ever a trackball or some kind of a, a dial, some kind of a, a you know USB dial or something, this would be great. You have to hit escape to get out of it. Because once you hit N, now like once you click here on the timeline, you hit N. I can't, I can't touch any button. I can't hit any buttons because this is just using this as a slider. I can do that, which I never want to do. Escape to get out of it. So let's get rid of that button really quickly. Let's go to here. Let's go to command palette. And let's put um, under N, let's put make subclip. Let's go to here to the more buttons, or sorry, and the edit buttons and put make subclip under N. Yeah, so N will be make subclip. Just somebody make a note of that. We'll have that there. That's gonna be fantastic. Um, and, and there. And for um, mouse shuttle, which is another button that does the same kind of thing, just, just a little faster, um, we can put um, a marker there. So um, semicolon will be uh, under the more buttons will be a red marker. So we have a red marker right there. And we can remap any of our buttons the way that we wanna work. And we can make it work any way that we think makes sense to us, which is great. We can map all these buttons there. I'll show you one that I don't like, which I'm not really big on, and I don't really appreciate enough. These two buttons right here, the up and down arrows, are move clip up and move clip down. Now, for some people, they love this. Um, so if you click on a clip, you can hit the up arrow and move a clip up vertically on the timeline up to a different video track. So you can make multiple video tracks just by moving clips up and moving them down, hitting the up and down arrow. That's cool. I never use that. I don't. It's not something I do. Sorry. So let's hear, let's go to keyboard settings and let's go to this uh, command palette. And here's the one that I do like. I saw somebody do this one time and I was like, how are you doing that? And it was like amazing. Menu to button reassignment. On the timeline, you can go here and you can zoom in and zoom out of the timeline with this little slider here. The shortcut to zoom in the slider is command bracket. Next to the P key, the command brackets would allow you to zoom in and zoom out. And I'm never going to remember that. I'm never going to use that worthwhile. So I'm going to go to Command Palette, Menu to Button Reassignment, and I'm going to say on this up arrow, I'm going to go to the Timeline Fast Menu because this is a menu. Timeline Fast Menu, and under Zoom, Zoom In, which is Command Bracket right here. So Zoom In is Command Bracket. I'm going to put this right in the up arrow. That way the up arrow is always just Zoom In. And for the down arrow, Menu to Button Reassignment, click on the button I want to replace, here, zoom, zoom out, the other bracket is zoom out. So zoom in and zoom out are right here, which means when I'm working with the sequence, I can just use this to zoom in and zoom out. And so that, so I can go forward and backward, you know, left and right arrows can go forward and backward, but also zoom in and zoom out. I can go forward and backward like so. And I can, that's just, it's so it's, it's like a, a running joystick right there between the up and down arrows and the left and right arrows. It just makes my world a lot better place. And I saw somebody do that one time and I'm like, I'm stealing that. And so that's set up for Chad's user profile. That's, that's my user profile right there. So that's set up just the way I want to work. Again, we'll look through other works, workspaces or we'll look through other settings and see how they work. And we'll do all kinds of fun stuff and explore there. But this is just kind of setting up the project, getting it started, getting it working, getting it functional. But this, again, this bin architecture of having stuff living inside of a bin. So we're saving, it just auto-saved. Command S, saving all the bins. 
and then we hop out of here and we're done. We can go file, close project, command shift W and hop back out to the welcome screen if we wanted to. So now I have this first project here. I haven't really done anything, but I have this project called MinMail CEA here and I can just say quit or I can just hit command Q to quit. Ask me to definitely want to leave the application. Yep. All right, and we'll come back and we'll get into some importing and some editing as we go further in lessons inside of Avid. All right, guys, have a good afternoon.